Since we are now talking about the rotation of rigid bodies, we must revisit the mass moment of inertia. So if you remember, we wrote the mass moment of inertia as the letter I here. And remember that is the resistance to angular acceleration. So the bigger that I is, the bigger the mass moment of inertia, the more difficult it is to rotate about that axis. So we have several equations here. And if you remember the parallel axis theorem, so if we have I is equal to I about the center of gravity plus the mass times the distance from the center of gravity squared. But let's take the example that we have this slender rod here and we're looking for the moment of inertia about the x-axis. So how do we find this? Well, we could integrate this whole thing, but most of the time we can find simple shapes in our data sheets in the back of the book where it gives us an equation for this. So if we're rotating about the x-axis here, which is also about the center of gravity, we can take a look in the back of the book and what we find is this equation here for about the x-axis, which is 1 12th ml squared. So about the center of gravity around the x-axis, we're going to have 1 12th ml squared. And that will be the, the uh, moment of, mass moment of inertia. Now, a lot of times, these slender rods do not rotate about the center of gravity. So a lot of times, they'll rotate about the end point of them. So let's draw another axis, x prime. So this would be swinging around this x prime axis, similar to a pendulum or something like that. All right, so we're looking for the mass moment of inertia rotating about this point, And it's going to be different. So we're going to use this parallel axis theorem here. We have already found the moment of inertia about the center of gravity. That's this value here. But then we need to add this md squared to it. So I'm going to say ix prime is equal to 1 12th ml squared plus md. And that's the distance from here to here. That's D, and we know that value is L over 2. From the center of gravity to the end is L over 2 divide, or squared. And let's simplify this. So we have 1 one twelfth ml squared here. And after we expand this, we have ml squared over 4. So we have 1 fourth plus 1 twelfth. I believe that is comes out to be one third m l squared. Now, if we look at the data sheet, what did we get? This value right here, one third m l squared. So that is the value if we were rotating about this x prime axis. So you need to make sure that you keep track of what axis you're rotating about and use the parallel axis theorem to shift that uh, rotational axis depending on the point you're rotating about. All right, the last refresh concerning the mass moment of inertia. You may remember the equation, the mass moment of inertia is also equal to mk squared. And what is k? m being the mass, k is actually the radius of gyration. So why would a problem or someone give you the radius of gyration instead of just giving you the mass moment of inertia? Well, the radius of gyration factors out the mass from the equation. So for example, let's say we have two objects that have the exact same shape. So you can think of two cylinders. And they have the exact same shape, but one is made out of steel and one is made out of plastic. The steel radius of gyration is going to equal the plastic radius of gyration because it's just based on the shape of it. Now, are these going to have different masses? Absolutely. So if we're analyzing a situation with different materials, it's handy to have the radius of gyration because then we can just multiply it by the mass here after we take the square. Likewise, just rearranging this equation, if we're 
trying to find the radius of gyration. That is nothing more than the square root of the mass moment of inertia divided by the mass of the object.